Hey guys, my name's Tomato Anus, also known as Needle Peen, and this is a segmented any percent speedrun of Doom 2016. This run is actually performed by Seeker, the current any percent world record holder for Doom. He also worked with me on writing the commentary for this run to make sure that all the explanations are as accurate as possible. If you would like to watch either this segmented run without commentary or Seeker's current any percent world record, which is also commentary free, there are links in the description below. Also, with this being any percent, glitches are allowed. If you would prefer a run without glitches, I would recommend you watch a speedrun of the 100% Ultra Nightmare category, which is a category that relies much less on glitches than any percent. There's a link in the description to the current world record run of it, performed by Bite Me. It's also worth noting that the any percent run is performed on a completely up-to-date version of the game. Everything you see in this run can still be done on any version of the game. The run starts just as any other playthrough of the game would, with the Doomslayer awakening from his sarcophagus and escaping from his binds to kill the nearby possessed. After all three possessed are killed, we're going to fire our gun continually until we activate a short scene. The reasons for this is by continually shooting our weapon, it will skip the slow animation of inspecting your pistol after killing the possessed. After the scene ends, the doors open and we position ourselves in a corner before running forward and performing what's referred to as a paper clip. A lot of the walls in the game are paper thin, and the player is able to clip through them by just wiggling back and forth, hence the paper clip. Once out of bounds, we make a beeline to the end of the level, skipping pretty much everything with a series of well-timed jumps. When speedrunning the game, binding jump to scrolling the mouse wheel will actually cause for you to jump slightly higher than a normal jump. This is because when you scroll, the game reads it as multiple jump inputs, so as you're lifting off the ground from your first jump, the game causes you to jump again since you're so close to the ground, giving you just a tad extra height. Once back in bounds, we need to get into the elevator and ride it to outside, but unfortunately the doors are closed. Luckily, walls are merely a suggestion, and we can position ourselves in a precise spot and interact with the button inside the elevator which will immediately begin the elevator ride. At this point, you may have noticed the FPS counter in the top right corner. During cutscenes, it's limited to 60, but during most moments throughout the game, the game is running at 200 frames per second. This is the frame rate that Doom is naturally capped at when playing on PC, and is attainable by turning off VSync and doing things like lowering your graphics and changing the graphics API to Vulkan. Playing at 200 FPS is very important in Doom for one reason, rail boosting. In a moment, you'll see what a rail boost is as we launch ourselves to the end of the first mission. Rail boosting is actually pretty simple to perform. All you have to do is find an object like a railing or an object that can serve as a proxy, and jump while near it, and begin holding W while you're in the air. This will cause for you to launch through the air with incredible velocity. This trick absolutely requires a high frame rate, and if attempted at a lower one, you either won't be able to perform the trick, or you won't have a ton of speed when doing it. Once we arrive at the end of the level, we interact with the touchpad and begin holding enter to automatically skip the end of level stats screen. While this level may have looked fairly easy, I can assure you it's actually really hard. Seeker is what one might call a god gamer, and pretty much makes Doom call him its daddy. The second level begins with us meeting my number one frick in all of gaming, Vega. He lets us know all about the Praetor suit, which you may have noticed we're wearing now despite having completed the first level naked. After Vega finishes his speech, Seeker is going to immediately leave the room and jump through the next room, which prevents him from getting stuck on the ground since it is a bit uneven in this area, and also look left the whole time to avoid imp spawns. He's then going to stand against the door and damage a possessed as it approaches him. Once it gets close enough, he's going to hurt the possessed just a little more so that he's able to perform a glory kill on it. Then, with precise positioning and timing, Seeker will perform a specific glory kill animation next to the door, which miraculously will clip him through and put him out of bounds. From there, Seeker will be able to then progress all the way through the rest of the level to the finish. Along the way, he's going to grab a heavy assault rifle. You'll notice that he's able to grab the rifle from a mile away, despite the Doom Slayer having pretty stubby arms. This is a trick called Extendo Grab. If you bind your weapon mod to the scroll wheel and look at an interactable object, scrolling the wheel in that direction will bring up the prompt for interacting with the object. This is used several times throughout the run, like grabbing the rifle here, as well as trying to use it to interact with the touchpads at the end of each level early, as we do our best inspector gadget impersonation. The third level of the game is called Foundry, and begins with Vega telling us more about the Praetor suit. 
As Vega continues his dialogue, Seeker is sure to stand a decent distance away from the door. The reason for this is that there's an invisible trigger closer to the door. If Seeker stands in the trigger when the level begins, none of the demons will spawn in the next room due to some checkpoint shenanigans. Similarly, if Seeker is standing too far away from the door, then the door won't open because he has to be past a trigger that opens the door. When Vega finishes his dialogue, the bad man is going to give us a little speech, at the end of which the door will open to the next room. As the door is opening, we load the game from the checkpoint which skips the animation of the door opening. Seeker then immediately runs into the next room over and grabs the micro-missile weapon modification before loading another checkpoint to save some time. The micro-missiles are going to be used all throughout the run as a method to damage boost ourselves both forward for extra speed and up for extra jump height. When we load back in, Seeker then begins clearing out enemies in the area and setting up another glory kill clip. This one is a bit more complicated of a setup, but Seeker was sure to lather himself up with some butter before this attempt and slides right through the wall. In the next room, we use a quick rail boost to launch ourselves over the forges and onto a landing across the room. From here, we're able to jump onto some small ledges and pull ourselves up onto some crossbeams, where we do another paperclip via the patented wiggle method. We're then able to finish off the level with another series of precise out-of-bounds movement, followed by jumping back in bounds and accessing the touchpad. One little speed strat that's employed throughout this game is that when moving throughout the level, we never want to strafe. Whenever we're moving, we only want to hold one directional button at a time. If you hold multiple buttons and begin to strafe, you actually move at a lower velocity than if you hold just one directional button. This next level is the Argent Facility and is actually my favorite level in the speedrun. The level begins by picking up the nearby plasma rifle, followed by jumping from some stairs into the ceiling of the level. From here, Seeker is able to bypass having to wait for Samuel Hayden to give his full speech and open the doors, and enter the main area of the level immediately. Seeker will then jump across the canyon and stand in a precise spot before performing a rail boost that will send him to the final room of the level. At the beginning of the next level, Argent Energy Tower, the first objective is to get the Thrust Boots from a nearby room. We're going to perform a quick micro-missile boost to accelerate our retrieval of them, after which we perform a rail boost to launch ourselves to the platform above us. When we finally grab the Thruster Boots, we wait for the animation to play out until we turn the left boot towards us, at which point we load from checkpoint to skip the remainder of the animation and save some time. Once we load back in, we perform the same rail boost again and then perform a big boy rail boost to launch ourselves all the way up the Argent Tower. When Seeker lands, he's sure to hit a checkpoint in the main room, after which he drops down the elevator shaft to grab a secret Gauss Cannon. With the Gauss Cannon obtained, he'll then reload from checkpoint to be back in the main room he just boosted to. When he loads in, Seeker is going to turn around and perform a Gauss boost, which is performed by facing away from the direction you want to go, jumping, and shooting the Gauss cannon. The recoil of the gun is so great that it launches him with a high velocity. Whenever performing a Gauss boost though, Seeker is sure to not hold any directional buttons, as that will actually cause him to slow down. Also, if Seeker jumps the moment he lands after a Gauss boost, he will perform a bunny hop and conserve most of his momentum, allowing for him to continue traveling at a high speed. After a brief back and forth with Olivia Pierce, she proceeds to do Lord Knows What, which knocks us back. Seeker then has to kill enough demons to trigger the Category 3 Dimensional Event, which has a countdown tied to it. After the countdown says 6, Seeker grabs the Invulnerability power-up and jumps down into the middle of the Argent Tower, and drops all the way down to a platform near the bottom. When he lands, he's going to Gauss boost to an Argent Energy Cell and level up his ammo capacity, after which the level will end and he will be brought to hell. As he's grabbing the Argent Energy Cell, the timer to finish the level begins, despite him having not killed any additional enemies from the ones he initially fought. This is believed to be due to the fact that when he jumped all the way down to this room, he hit a trigger that caused a bunch of enemies to spawn behind the first door he passes when he's falling, which spawns additional enemies, causing for the game to hit a max cap on enemies in the same map. 
This then causes for the already spawned enemies to be removed, which the game sees as a kill in this instant, thus ending the initial arena combat section. If you haven't been a fan of all of the Out of Bounds so far, but are still sticking around in hopes that the integrity of the speedrun will soon be saved with long combat sections and playing the game as intended, then you're in luck, because this level is actually played exactly as id software intended. As normal, when the level begins, we perform a couple Goss boosts to get going through the level. Then, we're gonna stop and use an extendo grab to teleport us up onto a platform above us. We then use a Goss boost and a micro missile boost to launch ourselves high enough to pull ourselves up onto an invisible ledge, after which we proceed to Goss boost while we're several hundred meters in the air. We're able to do this all the way to the end of the level, as intended, and just walk through the walls of the final room to access the touchpad and finish the level. I gotta say, that level is a testament to the brilliance of the developers over at id. I mean, flying through the air on invisible platforms? Who even comes up with this stuff? The next level, Argent Facility Destroyed, is another of my favorites in the speedrun. I think that for this level, I'm just going to let you watch and enjoy the fact that we're able to finish the level by the time Samuel Hayden is finishing his intro dialogue. The Argent Tower is destroyed. The portal can no longer be closed from this side. The Hell Energy flows from a location in their world we call the Well. Flesh and blood to walk between dimensions. <laughs> so there may be a way. Vega is trying to access Olivia's files. If you can get to the nearest terminal, we will provide you with information. That's all for now. Like, what the heck, man? This game is insane as a speedrun. To start the next level, we begin by recreating the intro of Half-Life. The goal of this level is to finally meet the bad man face to face. It's a little known fact, however, that the Doom Slayer is super flaky, so we're actually just gonna leave Samuel on red and do some wacky shit instead. Near the start of the level, we're going to load from checkpoint which resets all the enemies in the area. This is done because there's a mancubus around the corner who attacks the possessed in the area. We're going to perform a glory kill clip on one of these possessed, so ideally we want to make sure the mancubus doesn't kill it. With some precise positioning, shooting, and a missed fireball from the mancubus, Seeker is able to easily perform the glory kill clip and put us out of bounds. After a little bit of parkour, we drop down onto the ledge of the ground beneath us and load the checkpoint to put ourselves back in bounds. When Seeker loads back in, he's gonna go nuts with Goss boosting to get onto some ledges and immediately get out of bounds again. He's actually out of Goss cannon ammo at the moment, but luckily there's some ammo on the other side of an upcoming window. After doing to the ammo what every fat kid wishes they could do to a vending machine, Seeker boosts himself over a large gap, and continues to boost himself up and into the room that contains the BFG 9000. Once he grabs the BFG, he's then going to reload the checkpoint again to respawn ourselves back in the initial outside area we were in. Whenever you load a checkpoint in Doom, it doesn't remove any recently acquired weapons or upgrades, which is how we're able to load from checkpoint all throughout the run and maintain all the weapons that we're picking up. When we load back in, Seeker is going to perform the same series of Goss boosts and jumps to bring us to the ammo window again. He's going to grab some more ammo, as well as running around to the other side of the room and somehow grabbing a chainsaw through the glass as well? I don't know. Don't ask me. With his newly found ammo, Seeker is then able to finish off the level by Goss boosting out of bounds and dropping down to the bottom of the elevator at the end of the level. The Goss boosting in this section is actually real spooky, because there are some death triggers that you can hit if you mistime your double jumps or aren't moving fast enough, but Seeker is a legend and makes short work of the boosts. Similar to the first level, the doors to the elevator are closed, but by standing in the right spot and angling his view just right, he can interact with the touchpad and move on in the game.
The next level is the Lazarus Labs, and is split into two sections, sometimes referred to by runners as Lazarus 1 and Lazarus 2. The dividing segment between the two is a short cutscene that is one of the heaviest on lore development in the game, and really adds a lot to the story. After the elevator ride to begin the level, Seeker uses his chainsaw to kill an enemy through glass because, as we saw moments ago, glass seemingly has no physical effect on chainsaws in the Doom universe. This chainsaw kill was done to quickly refill on ammo. After a quick Gauss boost and drop, Seeker prepares for another glory kill clip by clearing out some impeding enemies that can mess up the trick, followed by standing in a precise location. After positioning himself correctly, he then damages the nearby possessed and waits a moment before shooting it one more time and performing the glory kill clip. As soon as he's out of bounds, he's then going to perform a couple Gauss boosts, followed by a rail boost and some more Gauss boosts to quickly progress through the level. Lazarus 1 officially ends when he accesses the touchpad at the elevator when he enters back in bounds. After the lore intensive cutscene, Seeker will perform another clip by interacting with a touchpad through the wall. This one is slightly different from others though, because the prompt will only show up when your character is lowering their position. To account for this, he takes out his chainsaw which causes the Doom Slayer to have a slight shaking animation with the rhythm of the chainsaw which moves him up and down slightly, allowing for him to interact with the panel. Once we're out of bounds, we're going to Gauss boost across a couple gaps and make our way to a boss fight at the end of the level. You may be asking why we aren't Gauss boosting while walking out of bounds here. The out of bounds in this area is pretty tricky and has a slanted floor that can cause for you to fall off if you jump around on it. Also, because our Gauss ammo is limited, Seeker chose to conserve it for a later part in the run. When Seeker jumps into the elevator at the end of the level, he's able to jump several times while in the air, due to the fact he crosses an invisible wall which refreshes his jumps. Coming up is the first real combat section of the run, so get ready for some fast paced action. After loading a checkpoint to skip some nonsense, the fight begins with Seeker Goss boosting backwards to put some distance between him and the Cyber Demon, and then shooting the BFG above the Cyber Demon. When the shot is flying above the Cyber Demon, Seeker then slows down time by pulling up the weapon wheel. This causes for the shot to continually deal damage to the Cyber Demon and cause for it to be downed in one shot. Once Seeker finishes the first phase of this fight, he then will load from checkpoint again to skip some more nonsense. Phase 2 of the fight is much more difficult, with the Cyber Demon walling you into a tight alley from the get go. Our strat for this fight is to shoot the Cyber Demon once with the BFG in order to stun it, followed by micro missile boosting to jump on top of the Cyber Demon, followed by jumping over the big spooky gate to finish the level. Okay, so I may have lied to you last level when I was talking about how there was going to be fast paced combat, but there actually is some combat in the next level which is called Titan's Realm. Once he begins progressing through the level, Seeker needs to clear out two rooms worth of enemies that are adjacent to each other. Luckily, we still have two shots left of the BFG, and that can be used to clear the combat requirements for this area. That counts as combat, right? Once he's in the next hallways, Seeker is going to use a Gauss boost to land on a normally inaccessible ledge where he'll be able to just jump out of bounds. Once out of bounds, he's going to then Gauss boost through the rest of the level and then perform a paperclip to get back in bounds and finish the level. I'd also like to say that while making this video, I kept looking for ways to make a joke about Clippy the paperclip from Microsoft Word, but I couldn't find a way to make it work and it also led me down a rabbit hole of Clippy Rule 34. So this video took me a while to make for that reason. The next level is the Necropolis and requires a bit more combat. Right away, we begin running towards the teleporter, which upon entering, we immediately begin Gauss boosting and pick up a missile launcher. We're then going to use the missile launcher to kill some nearby enemies while making a quick pit stop to grab another Argent energy cell and level up our ammo once again. 
This is to refill our BFG ammo, and it also completely refills our Gauss cannon ammo, which we'll take advantage of by Gauss boosting up onto a ledge to go out of bounds yet again. When Seeker does an upcoming Gauss boost across a large gap towards a big black wall, he has to be sure to land on top of the rock along the wall. If he lands on the lower part of the rock, he will die from fall damage, making this one of the more dangerous Gauss boosts in the run. Once we're back in bounds, Seeker grabs a haste power up and hits a trigger by some nearby stairs in order to spawn some cacodemons. He then jumps across and uses the BFG to kill the cacodemons as well as a mancubus and baron of hell that begin to spawn after he grabs the green armor in the middle of the platform. Seeker then finishes off this area of the level and is brought to another boss fight, this time with a hell guard. Utilizing the same BFG weapon wheel trick, Seeker is able to make quick work of this boss as well as the two hell guards that spawn after defeating the first one. When the fight begins against the two hell guards, we have to open the weapon wheel pretty early after we shoot. The reason for this is that it ensures the hell guard on the left won't trigger its death animation where we can glory kill it. This is because if it does enter its death animation, then we have to perform a glory kill within 3 seconds, otherwise it regenerates 1 eighth of its health while we kill the Hellguard on the right. The reason why the Hellguard on the left doesn't enter its death animation when we pull up the weapon wheel early is that the Hellguard is busy jumping into the air, which leaves it at a sliver of health where we can just melee it into its death animation after killing the other Hellguard. Before Seeker grabs the Crucible, he lines himself with the big chain in the background to ensure he's standing right in front of where the Crucible will spawn. After these quick fights, the Doomslayer is then able to finally claim the Crucible, and is returned to Mars by the same guys who I see surrounding my bed whenever I have sleep paralysis. Back on Mars, we immediately paperclip out of bounds and then perform an enormous rail boost to skip having to actually play the game. This rail boost is actually pretty difficult because you have to maneuver as close to the inbounds area as possible or else you'll die in midair due to kill zones. Once we land, we then perform what's probably the most precise rail boost in the game, which requires us to stand in an incredibly exact location, and it also requires for us to pull up our map and buffer a jump and W input. Despite the precision required for this rail boost, it's still a little bit easier than the one performed right before it. This rail boost brings us straight to Vega's core. Unfortunately, this is where we have to sacrifice our daddy in order to use huge Argent stores to go back to hell one more time. In an attempt to lessen the blow of what is the emotional equivalent of the entirety of Homeward Bound, the Doomslayer backs up Vega and tucks him in our pocket, thus finishing the level and bringing us to the last level in the game, Argent Denur. The last level is actually one of the most feared levels by speedrunners, due to the climbing being very slippery and dangerous Gauss boosts, where you can easily mistime your double jumps or not have enough speed with your boosts. Right away in the last level, Seeker breaks out his inner mountain goat and scales some rock formations. From here, he'll then proceed to Gauss boost over canyons and enormous gaps to go all the way to the final boss of the game, which is Olivia Pierce in the form of a spider demon.
As Seeker drops down into the final combat arena, he's sure to land on a rock to his left along the way, which breaks up his fall and makes sure he doesn't die from fall damage or possibly die from some kill triggers. Right away, Seeker will boost over to some BFG ammo and perform the weapon wheel attack once more. When we perform the weapon wheel trick in this fight, we look at the ground to make sure we maintain a steady 200 FPS, which slows the BFG shot as much as the game can. In addition, we have to wait around 10 seconds to ensure that the boss's phase 1 life pool is completely drained. After this, the Spoder Daemon will begin to drop health and ammo, indicating that it's about to enter its second, electric phase. However, Seeker is able to skip this phase by simply shooting some micro-missiles at the boss. After this, Seeker will then grab one more bit of BFG ammo and finish off Miss Pierce. This then ends the game and the speedrun of Doom 2016, and results in a cutscene where Samuel Hayden pulls the ultimate sneak dissa move and steals the Crucible, presumably leading into the story of the soon-to-be-released Doom Eternal. If you made it this far in the video, I'd just like to say thank you, and that both myself and Seeker appreciate you. Seeker is an awesome dude, and if it weren't for him, this video wouldn't be possible. Also, this video wouldn't be possible without the modern Doom speedrunning community, who are a really wholesome bunch of human beings. I highly encourage you to drop a follow for not only Seeker, but also other runners who you can find on the Doom 2016 speedrunning leaderboard on speedrun.com. Also, I'd like to apologize if there were any cicada noises in the background of this video. They decided that the perfect time and place to have an orgy would be right outside my window as I recorded this. Outside of that, if you have any other games you'd like to see a speedrun explained for, I ask you leave a comment below and I'll add it to a list of games that I've already began compiling for potential videos. I read every comment you guys post, so if you have any insults you want to throw my way as well, that's a great way to get them to me. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed the video. I know it's not a Fallout speedrun, but hopefully you liked it anyways. Until next time, I've been Tomato Anus, and I hope you have an above average day. I don't expect you to agree. But with this, we can continue our work. I am not the villain in this story. I do what I do because there is no choice. Rerouting tether coordinates complete. Our time is up. I can't kill you, but I won't have you standing in our way. <laughs>